For the conquest is never perfect till the war be at an end. And the war is not at an end till there be peace and unity. And there can never be unity and concord in any one kingdom, but where there is but one king, one allegiance, and one law. At the beginning of the 16th century, the monarchs of Tudor England feared that rivals at home or enemies from abroad might use Ireland as a base against them. If they were to continue to rule England, then they must rule Ireland as well. Ireland presented a threat. It was a land ripe for conquest. England had been involved in the affairs of Ireland since Norman times, but it was only in the capital city, Dublin, that English ways still held. The Tudor Lord Deputies always had to struggle to impose their will on the rebellious people of Ireland. Around Dublin lay an area known as the English Pale. But even the Pale was unstable. Its bounds shifted and changed in an endless succession of local wars. At the edge of the Pale was a dangerous frontier land. Gaelic warlords and their followers were always a threat. They lived just beyond the Pale and were ever ready to harry and raid the small English colony. Control of this unruly land was an expensive business. It proved cheaper to delegate effective power to the head of the most powerful Irish family, the Fitzgeralds of the House of Kildare. The great Earl of Kildare was the Lord Deputy of Ireland, and yet in political terms, uh, Kildare was an enemy of the Tudors, but it was cheaper for them to, to use him and use his authority to rule the Pale and through the Pale as much as possible the rest of Ireland for as long as possible. And indeed that policy went on until about 1534 when um, there was the rebellion of Silken Thomas. The hothead Silken Thomas believing an untrue report that his father, Garrett Og Fitzgerald, had been beheaded in London, immediately went into rebellion against the Crown. The Kildare stronghold at Maynooth was captured, and those who surrendered executed. This proved a turning point as the English struggled to reassert their authority in Ireland. I think we shouldn't always consider the Tudor conquest as a conquest. Uh, that is to say, in the sense of something that happened overnight, or something that was specifically a military subjugation occupation of the country. It wasn't like that at all. Uh, basically, throughout the long period of Tudor rule, uh, it was a question of extending the administrative power of the crown. And that was a very difficult thing to do. Sometimes it called for military intervention, sometimes it called for uh, an increase in... Uh, armies in Ireland, and uh, usually this was a pretty disastrous experiment. It was also a very expensive one. Uh, and expense is the key to most of Tudor policy in Ireland. The image of Ireland by John Derrick gives an English view of the mere or wild Irish who lived according to Gaelic custom. A wood kern or foot soldier holds an axe while handing his lord a lance. They're about to set out on a cattle raid against a neighbour. Led by their piper, the kern attack and burn a neighbouring farm. Raids such as this were commonplace throughout the country. Great lords like Kildare used them to punish their enemies, and lesser lords paid tribute to them in order to avoid the consequences of a raid. The tribute was a form of protection money against disaster. Cattle raids were often followed by feasting. Here, the chief of the McSweeney's of Donegal is entertained at his table by a harper. As with others in the book, this picture is designed to confirm English ideas of Irish barbarity. 
I wouldn't say it was anarchy. I'm not saying that people were out killing one another all the time, but it's very much controlled. It took the form, really, of um, a series of relationships which were fairly formally established between the great lord and his subjects, uh, which required the subjects to pay a certain amount of um, rents, uh, black rents, they might be called, um, annually to the lord. Now, of course, this wouldn't be in cash. It would normally be in cattle, um, sometimes in crops, um, often in services. M most importantly, the obligation to do military service or to work on the Lord's domain. But you can identify certain key families in each of the provinces uh, who control the system in, within their own areas. People like the Fitzgeralds in Desmond, in Munster. Uh, people like the Clan Ricard Burks in Connaught. And people like O'Neill uh, in Ulster and O'Donnell in West Ulster. And above all, people like the Fitzgeralds of Kildare and the Butlers of Ormond. And between these two major families, there was established a kind of national hierarchy in which the Fitzgeralds had allies in Ulster amongst the O'Neills. Uh, the Butlers had allies in Ulster amongst the O'Donnells. And so that be between them, a kind of national two-party system was in operation in which Anglo-Irish and Gaelic-Irish allied against Anglo-Irish and Gaelic-Irish on the other side. A Lord Deputy like Sir Henry Sidney had to make many military expeditions out from Dublin Castle to impose the will of the Crown on rebellious subjects. In his dealings with the native lords, his first recourse was to diplomacy and persuasion. If that failed, he would resort to force of arms as he sought to control the violent and chaotic world of the countryside. The ensuing wars were conducted with unrelenting savagery. A familiar pattern of rebellion, followed just as surely by submission, was soon established. It was all part of a deadly struggle for power, about who would rule Ireland. Thomas Butler was the 10th Earl of Ormond. Like many other Irish lords, he was a Queen's man. His house at carrick on Shore in Munster was built in the English style. Added on to an existing castle, it's unusual for the time in that it's virtually unfortified. This reflects the growth of peace and stability in the Ormond Lordship. Thomas Butler, or Black Tom, was well used to English ways. He was brought up at the English court following the death of his father. Queen Elizabeth I was his cousin, and Ormond gloried in his association with her. Queen Elizabeth was a Protestant ruler, she was branded as a heretic and excommunicated by the Pope. Her great fear was that a Catholic rival from the continent would come to the aid of Irish rebels. In the autumn of 1580, James Fitzgerald Fitzmaurice of the House of Desmond landed in Dingle on the extreme southwest tip of Ireland. He was accompanied by the Papal Nuncio and a combined Italian and Spanish force of some 600 men. They issued a call for all Irishmen to join them in a crusade in the name of the Catholic faith. English troops, including Edmund Spencer the poet and a young gentleman adventurer called Walter Raleigh, was sent to intercept them. The Catholic force was trapped and put under siege in the remote promontory fort of Smerwick. Faced with an English artillery barrage, the invaders soon laid down their arms. They were leaving themselves at the mercy of Lord Grey of Wilton, a man already noted for the fervent zeal of his Protestantism. Without further delay, he gave the order to execute all 600. This sets a pattern, uh, which, strangely enough, is perpetuated right through in the centuries following. First of all, you have the Spanish interfering over really over the religious question, because by now um, those who are opposed to royal authority in Ireland are quite likely to look for support from Spain. And the uh, Spanish 
monarch is likely to regard them as natural allies, does regard them as allies, uh, bound together by religion. So it's, it's not just uh, intervention in the affairs of, in the realms of the King of England, it is also um, a religious crusade in a sense, a crusade against Protestantism uh, in its English manifestation. Uh, but, uh, of course, once that pattern is established, then in the um, 17th and more so in the 18th century, you have the intervention of the French in Ireland on the basis that this is England's Achilles heel. This is the weak place. This is the back door to England. The Desmond Rebellion dragged on for several more years leaving much of the province of Munster a wasteland. A vivid description of the human cost of it all comes from the pen of Edmund Spencer. Out of every corner of the woods and glens they came, creeping forth upon their hands, for their legs would not bear them. They looked like anatomies of death. They spoke like ghosts crying out of their graves. They did eat the dead carrions, happy where they could find them. Yea, and one another soon after. Insomuch as the very carcasses they spared not to scrape out of their graves. In a short space, there were almost none left, and the most populous and plentiful country suddenly left void of man and beast. With the collapse of Irish resistance, the Desmond lands were confiscated by the Crown. Much of Munster was then left open to plantation by English settlers. Men like Walter Raleigh were quick to seize their opportunity. Along with other adventurers from Devon and Somerset, he acquired large estates in counties Cork and Waterford. He built himself a house called Myrtle Grove in Yall. It's believed that the first potatoes ever to be grown in Ireland were planted here. Like tobacco, the potatoes were bought from the new English colonies in North America. Raleigh's ambitions lay more in the Americas than in Ireland, so after a few years he was to sell his estates to another Englishman, Sir Richard Boyle, who was definitely a man with a future. Boyle was penniless when he arrived in Ireland from Kent in 1588. He became the first Earl of Cork and made money buying and selling land. By the time of his death, in 1643, he'd become the wealthiest man in the country. And he could easily afford to pay for this elaborate family tomb in the parish church in York. The province of Ulster was the last part of Ireland to be conquered by the English. Remote and isolated, it was protected by great woods and boggy terrain. The O'Neill clan, who inaugurated their chieftains at Tullahog, County Tyrone, dominated the province. Their leader in Elizabethan times was Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone. Like Thomas Butler, O'Neill had been educated as an English nobleman and had served the Queen loyally. Then, as the English began to encroach more and more into his territory, he had no choice but to rebel. In 1593, he adopted the defiant title, The O'Neill, and was soon training an army for war. The training of O'Neill's army actually goes back to when O'Neill was a Queen's man, a favourite of Queen Elizabeth, who actually thought him quite a grand fellow in the terms of the time. He'd been to court, he'd been educated in England, and uh, he was so well thought of by the Queen that in fact he was allowed to keep a standing army of 600 men, ostensibly for the defence of his own lands, and men that would be used to fight for the Queen when the need arose. O'Neill very, very cleverly allowed that small number of 600 uh, to rotate from year to year, and by so doing he managed to train a much larger force so that when the opportunity came to rebel against uh, English rule in Ireland, he had far more than 600 men available to him. In fact, it's said that at one stage he had the availability of somewhere in the region of 30,000 men under arms in the province of Ulster. Not all of them Irish, 
uh, a very large number of them would in fact have been Scots. As the pressure on Ulster increased, the Maguire stronghold in Enniskillen fell to an English army. Refortified, it had great strategic importance in a string of castles stretching from Newry in the east to Ballyshannon in the west. The front line in the great confrontation between Gaelic Ulster and the might of England was along the Blackwater River. The Blackwater forms the border between Armagh and Tyrone and the English built forts here to threaten the O'Neill heartland from the south. In theory, the forts were a threat to the Irish, but each garrison was isolated in the middle of hostile territory. So because they had to be continually supplied with fresh food and ammunition, they became a constant drain on English resources. On the 14th of August, 1588, Marshal Bagenal led a column of 4,000 men out from the safety of Armagh. Their object was to relieve one of the Blackwater forts which had been under heavy attack. The column was ambushed at the Yellow Ford and Bagenal, along with almost half his men, was killed. The rest had to abandon their equipment and retreat in disorder. The Battle of the Yellow Ford was the most decisive defeat ever inflicted on an English army in Ireland. At that moment, it appeared that the whole country was at the mercy of O'Neill. One of the principal weaknesses of O'Neill's uh, military capability was the fact that he couldn't attack the city of Dublin. When he had almost all of Ireland at his mercy, uh, he really needed to attack and to capture the city of Dublin because ever since Norman times, it was a principle of, of uh, warfare and of conquest in Ireland that whoever held Dublin held Ireland. And uh, he obviously wanted the prize of Dublin, but he simply couldn't attack it because he didn't have the artillery, he didn't have the engineering ability that was needed to launch a siege on a walled city. And uh, that really meant that his campaign was doomed because he couldn't take the key city of Dublin and there would always be the availability of the port of Dublin uh, as a line of communication to England to bring further soldiers, further reinforcements in for the Lord Deputy's army. O'Neill hoped that the Spanish would come to his aid in the north of Ireland. Then, in September 1601, a Spanish force landed in Kinsale, County Cork, hundreds of miles away from their allies in Ulster. Anticipating an attack, the Spanish set about fortifying the town. The response of the English under Lord Deputy Mountjoy was immediate. He mustered as many troops as possible and laid siege to the town of Kinsale. In the depths of winter, O'Neill and O'Donnell began to move south towards Kinsale. When they arrived, Mountjoy found himself surrounded. All three armies were weak, the Spanish and the English from lack of food and disease, the Irish from their long march. Mountjoy had the most to gain from an immediate battle in open country. On the morning of Christmas Eve, 1601, the Irish began to move towards the English lines. They hoped to take them by surprise, but Mountjoy was alert, and he used his cavalry to charge O'Neill's foot soldiers, who quickly broke and scattered. The Spanish took little part in the battle, and nine days later surrendered. After a few short hours of battle, the Tudor conquest of Ireland was complete. All the hopes of Gaelic Ireland were dead.